The next uh, Jewish festival is Hanukkah, which is the uh, festival of dedication, sometimes called the Feast of Lights, which uh, uh, goes back to the time of the Maccabean Revolt in the years uh, just prior to the birth of Jesus. And uh, it emphasizes a uh, miracle of the oil not running out for the lamps uh, for the Jews during that, that difficult time. Uh, it corresponds roughly with our Christmas season or the, or the Christian celebration of, of Christmas in December. Um, it emphasizes the idea of Jewish independence, of being a free people, so, you know, freedom, but also the rededication and purification of the second temple uh, that occurred under the Maccabees during that, that uh, revolt. Uh, a further application would be, of course, a uh, rededication of one's own faith and, and oneself as a temple, a living temple for God. Uh, of course, the Apostle Paul picks up on this idea and expands it in a uniquely Christian sense, talking about Christians and uh, humans in general, their, their bodies being a temple for uh, God's presence and spirit. And so that uh, we should treat ourselves in a manner that is, is pure, righteous, and, and sacred. Uh, not that we are gods and divine, but that we are something special God has made to uh, have a relationship with and to uh, through his spirit to to indwell and to guide and and help us in life so anyway those those are ideas that are a part of the Hanukkah celebration uh, then later in the uh, what in, in toward the springtime on our calendar around uh, April is the uh, Passover festival which is a remembrance of deliverance from slavery in Egypt through uh, God's miraculous intervention and the guidance, leadership of Moses, the wilderness wanderings, and eventually the possession of Canaan, the conquest of Canaan by the Jews, and looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and the Passover very much emphasizes this messianic uh, idea that God would send a Messiah who is a true holy one, anointed one, uh, who would guide the people. And there were various approaches or viewpoints concerning who that individual might be and what the essence and nature of the individual might be. And we'll get into that a little more when we get to Christianity, uh, which became the premier kind of view uh, arising out of Judaism when, when the way, what the early Christians were called, uh, began to promote the idea that Jesus was, in fact, the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. Uh, but we'll talk about that more later. Um, this corresponds roughly, again, with the Christian celebration of Easter, or the resurrection of Jesus. This is roughly the same time of year. Then uh, we ha have the uh, Feast of Purim, which is uh, the Feast of Lots, it is a remembrance of divine protection for Esther and her father Mordecai and the Jewish people uh, in the Old Testament. Um, Esther becomes a heroic figure and a woman as a heroic figure when the Jews are being oppressed and being threatened, and this is in part due to a falling away from righteousness and purity and faith in Yahweh. And uh, Mordecai has a visitation from God in which he uh, tells his daughter, tells Esther, that you have been called by God to, to really become, fulfill the role of a, a prophetic voice concerning these times. And what she's told to do becomes applicable to people of all times. And what she's told is that she must, in her faith, be willing to stand up and speak to expose the wrongs and the evils and then call people back to... Uh, the you know appropriate correct relationship with God, which certainly is is applicable to all times and all places, but uh, she initially resists that because she's afraid of what will happen, and then uh, God through Mordecai tells her uh, what you most fear will in fact happen if you refuse to stand up for what's right, what's true, 
and I think this is a, that that is very much applicable to where even in our current culture we are today when we fail to stand up to things that are wrong to to evil oftentimes that evil triumphs and the very thing that we think is is the worst case scenario becomes the reality this certainly is what happened in Nazi Germany where uh, there was a failure to stand up uh, when maybe a, the loss of millions of lives could have been averted and then the Holocaust happened and when people finally did take a stand not that it was too late because there was an overturning of that but at, at great expense at great suffering and sorrow so uh, prayers are offered during this time and a ceremonial meal is consumed and uh, it consists of traditional Jewish foods kosher foods and wine singing and celebrating along with the reading of the book that that I just mentioned. Uh, let me turn my page here. A reading of the Book of Esther. Uh, let me talk for a few minutes now about some of the dietary practices and cultural rites, rituals, in Judaism. Uh, Jewish dietary practices deal with nutrition and hygiene combined with ritual purity. Uh, foods that are symbolically viewed as uh, unclean versus clean. And this is not to say that they actually there's something dangerous or wrong with eating some of these things, but they were symbolically identified for ritual spiritual purposes. Okay, um, In some cases, there were foods that were recommended over others just because they were healthier and better for you, you know, for a person. But the foods that were viewed as ritually pure or correct were called, you may have heard this word, called kosher foods. Uh, and there was a preparation of those foods that was also identified as kosher or the correct way that they need to be prepared and served. Um, foods that were not considered kosher are foods like pork, shellfish, uh, meat that was consumed with dairy products, uh, you know, things of that sort, and... Uh, so, for example, you wouldn't eat lobster or, or shrimp. And, of course, we know that eating lobster and shrimp is, is not intrinsically unhealthy and unclean, but ceremonially they viewed it that way. And there may be some reasons for that. We won't go into all that now, but, but there, there could be symbolic reasons that they would ch choose those kinds of foods. Um, Religious and cultural rites included a number of things. One is the uh, wearing of uh, tefillin, or what we call in English phylacteries. These were boxes, little boxes that were worn on the sleeve or on a band, a headband on the forehead. And those boxes contained scripture passages, scripture verses. The idea was that God's word was in the mind and in the heart. So it was symbolic of God's word's were being internalized in the individual. Uh, there was also the prayer shawl called talit, uh, usually white with dark stripes, uh, brown, black, gray, and it, it was a covering for the head and the body. And it signified uh, humility before God. Okay. Uh, there was also the uh, skull cap which you may have seen, sitting on the very back of the head, the little round uh, cap, and that's called a, a, a kippah, and it signified a reverence for God. Um, the mezuzah was a scripture container as well that was placed on a doorpost inside the home, and it signified that God's word is respected and is uh, supreme, in this place, in this dwelling. And it was a visible reminder of that fact right there at the doorpost. So all who entered or left, you know, encountered that. In a literal sense, encountered God's word as they came and went. Uh, circumcision, the ritual performed on male babies eight days after birth, and it signified God's calling of Abraham and the covenant with Israel. Uh, the additional benefit, of course, was hygienic, uh, and, and this was you know, very significant in times and places where cleanliness, physical, bodily cleanliness, was, was at a premium.
Uh, but then, of course, circumcision became a visible uh, sign to the person himself that he was set apart and different from the other people around. Uh, this is one of the reasons as well that Judaism is not to be seen as a race of people. Rather, it is a group of people called out to be distinct, unique, and different. But in the Old Testament, this calling was for them to be in relationship with God, but for the express purpose of demonstrating this uniqueness in their relationship to appeal to those who were non-Jewish to come into a relationship with God. Literally, they were called to be a beacon and a light to the non-Jews to come into relationship with the one true God. Now, sadly, historically, uh, oftentimes they, they failed greatly in fulfilling you know, that, that role, that calling. Uh, when we get to Christianity and Jesus emerges on the scene, he, uh, he confronts that and shows that historically there's been this failing. But the good news he brings, which he calls good news, is that he, in fact, is God in the flesh and that he has come in the form of a human to fulfill himself this calling to call all people into a relationship with God uh, where forgiveness, redemption, reconciliation, restoration, and a core in the relationship of true, real love uh, is supreme. And this is really the heart of what Jesus presented concerning himself and his work. Uh, but we'll get to that when we get to Christianity a little more. Uh, also, the bar mitzvah or the, and the bat mitzvah were the ceremonies that occurred for boys at age 13, the bar mitzvah, and for girls at roughly the same age, the bat mitzvah, in which a celebration of the transition from being children to becoming adults, boyhood to manhood girlhood to womanhood uh, were celebrated and these were great celebrations within the community and for the family uh, it's a little bit like what back you may not know much about this but back traditionally uh, in the in the southern United States uh, at earlier times they had what were called coming out balls for young girls debutantes who they would hold a party for uh, to celebrate their becoming you know, women and emerging into the world fully as, as adult women. Um, the bar mitzvah occurred about twelve, about age 13 for boys. The bat mitzvah could, could range from anywhere from roughly around 12 to 18, uh, but there was also uh, included in that for the girls a ceremony called the mikvah, a ritual bath, which was a commemoration of the first menstrual cycle for a, a girl and again a sign that she was now becoming uh, a, you know a woman so having said that let's look for a few I minutes Could you try again? sorry about that having said that let's uh, look for a few minutes at the divisions within contemporary Judaism uh, today and uh, I'm gonna go back a little bit in time to the uh, time just after the beginning of the early church in the first century to the second century uh, when Sephardic Jews rose and, and uh, uh, exerted an influence in Spain. This was in the second century, about the middle of the second century, and uh, they associated their practices with a mythical land that they call Sephar, which is where they get the name Sephardic Jew uh, during that time. Also, um, later, around 1000 CE, there was a Jewish movement from Ashkenaz, and they were called the Ashkenazic Jews. Uh, they claimed to be direct descendants of Noah, and who settled in the north of Central Europe, probably migrating through France uh, with the Diaspora. And then finally, from more ancient times, uh, the Falasha Jews, Orthodox and religious Jews who settled in Ethiopia, and who accept uh, only the Torah as canonical. So it's only the first five books of Moses that they look to as actually inspired and errant word. Uh, this group of Jews also became associated with uh, Coptic Ethiopian, Ethiopian Christians. And uh, the Coptic Ethios Ethiopian Christians um, claimed to be the... Uh, 
in a way, in, in a way directly tied to and even descendants of King Solomon through uh, the Queen of Sheba. And there are traditions and legends that say, for example, that he gifted her and those people, the Ark of the Covenant, and even today there, there are Coptic uh, Christians who claim that the Ark of the Covenant is actually stored in a secret place in one of the uh, one of the churches in Ethiopia. Those churches, by the way, are remarkable. They're carved out of stone, down through the stone, into the earth, and they're amazing uh, architectural wonders that, that you might look up, just the Ethiopian Christian churches, uh, and kind of get a look at what those are like. Uh, this might resonate with you a little bit in the story of uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, because this is one of the areas he looks toward and goes to for you know seeking the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant, and of course that all plays out during World War II and the Nazis. They're trying to get the Ark of the Covenant as well, and it turns into an amazing uh, action adventure story, a lot of fun. But there are elements of his history and legend that 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 film and that story are are based on. So they didn't just just pull it out of thin air. There were there were reasons they they approached it as they did. Uh, there actually is a real-life uh, archaeologist from the early 20th century that Indiana Jones got based on. Uh, so you might want to look that up and, and research that as well. And uh, he did some pretty amazing things himself. Anyway, uh, the divisions in mo the modern era of Judaism range from Orthodox Judaism all the way to what's called Reconstructionist Judaism, very conservative to very liberal. Okay, the Orthodox Judaism is religious and conservative, and may uh, may be viewed as integrationists who participate with non-Jewish culture, or separationists who do not participate in non-Jewish culture. They separate themselves out from the rest of culture. So it can be either one. But the point is, uh, it tends to be patriarchal, male dominant, and it has a strict adherence to Jewish law and social, cultural standards, practices, mores. And, and the adherence to Jewish law is a strict reverence for uh, the Old Testament writings themselves. This becomes their guide for faith and practice. And so it's really a step away from some of the Kabbalic, uh, mystical Judaism, Judaism that arose in the Middle Ages. And it's more of a return to a what I think is a more Old Testament biblical uh, perspective about authority. Uh, alongside that, there's a conservative Jewish movement or a Jewish branch that is not quite as extreme as Orthodoxy, uh, but still are fairly Orthodox, and they call they go go by the the name Conservative Judaism. Uh, the roots for that movement come out of Germany where you know, the Jews moved north into northern and central Europe, uh, there's a strong movement of conservative Judaism in the United States. Uh, it's about half of the total Jewish population in the country. Uh, moderate, it's moderate, but also committed to maintaining traditions, like uh, the use of, of Hebrew in worship. This is a little bit like the conservative, uh, more conservative branches are uh, of the Roman Catholic Church that insist upon the use of Latin in, in uh, the Roman Mass as opposed to English. Okay, so uh, it's a little bit like that, that Hebrew is the language that is most revered and used in worship. Uh, the third branch that we find active today is Reform Judaism. Its or origins go back to Moses Mendelssohn in the uh, early to, to late 1700s. Uh, he was an early proponent, major influence of, of Reformation in Judaism, and emphasized the assimilation of Jews into the larger non-Jewish culture. Now, remember, I told you all the way back to the Renaissance, there was a tendency for this simply because it was a way for Jews to protect themselves from persecution. Uh, in this approach, obviously, over time, many of the traditional conservative elements of Jewish faith and practice began to be relaxed and de-emphasized. Okay? So the retention of Jewish identity was, was maintained, but some of the more conservative, orthodox approaches to religious faith and life uh, were, were de-emphasized. Then finally, we have Reconstructionist Judaism, 
found and promoted by Mordecai Kaplan in the late 1800s all the way to the 1980s. He lived a long time. But uh, it was influenced by the American ideals of democracy and pragmatism as a philosophy. What is practical? Okay, So the view in this approach is, uh, is that the traditional Jewish identity from Israel and the Old Testament is uh, de-emphasized in favor of the American ideal of freedom and identity as Americans, okay? And that uh, the prag pragmatism is, this is just the practical thing. If this is where you live, it's more practical to blend and fit in there. Uh, it, the emphasis is upon secular, secularization, not, uh, uh, not the, the sacred aspects of Judaism. Or the religious aspects. So Reconstruction Judaism becomes much more of a secular Jewish identity, okay? Uh, things that, that identify Jews in terms of their music, their literature, uh, you know, Jewish foods, but the emphasis upon the religious ritual and religious practices is, is really de-emphasized and downplayed. Uh, in fact, this has created a, a divide in Judaism where more conservative Jews have tended to look to Israel as the promised land and Jerusalem as the center of Judaism, whereas the Reconstructionist, more liberal Judaism has said, this doesn't matter, we don't even need to have a return to Israel. Okay, So that, that's become a bit of a conflict as well. And again, the divide there between the conservative Orthodox and the more liberal is right about 50-50 uh, in this, this country. Um, The Bible, orthodox, literal interpretation of the Bible, are largely replaced by a more symbolic, metaphorical approach that, again, de-emphasizes the spiritual relationship of Jews with Yahweh over what are the things we can learn about how to live and how to practice our culture uh, in a practical way. Okay, so having said all of that, I want to say a word or two real quickly about, because we had talked about... Uh, we had talked about slavery and the modern slave trade, talked about slavery in the Old Testament. I gave you a handout about all that. And there was one aspect of that that I didn't address that I really wanted to because I think it's important and most people are not aware of this. Now, this is not hard to find out. You can research it and very easily you find out these numbers. But I wanted to uh, clarify, if I could, the European and the African slave trade that occurred from the mid-1600s to... Uh, the mid-1800s, um, because there's a misconception about the number of slaves that were brought to the, to the, quote, New World. And by New World, we have, to, we have to, to understand that New World included Canada, what became the United States, uh, the Caribbean, uh, uh, Mesoamerica, you know, Mexico and, and Costa Rica, Nicaragua, those areas, but also Latin America. So in all of the New World, and of course the New World is a vast, vast expanse, but in all of the New World, when one asks the question, how many slaves were brought uh, to the New World during that time of the slave trade? And of course the emphasis has been upon uh, uh, African slaves uh, when, when it's talked about. Now that's very true. African slaves were taken by... by in, massive significant numbers and brought to the new world but i mentioned to you in class also in the 1600s there were irish slaves that were brought in significant massive numbers okay who were not you know black africans they were fair-skinned uh, irishmen part of uh, the british isles and of course they were preyed upon because of the wars between england and ireland and scotland and uh, England wanted to break the power of, of Ireland, so they engaged in that practice to try to, to, to make that happen. Anyway, just in terms of the African slave trade, uh, the total number of African slaves that were brought to the New World was between 11 and 12 million. Now, to give you a corresponding figure, 11, between 11 and 12 million is also the number of people that were killed in the Nazi Holocaust. 
about half of those were Jews, about half of them were non-Jews, but, but the same total number. Of course, Hitler accomplished that in a very short time compared to the 200 years of, of slave trade. But what I want to get to is a clarification about those numbers, how they spin out, and where those people went, okay? Uh, and again, this is not to in any way defend the, the practice of slavery or slavery as a trade. It is reprehensible. It is absolutely wrong. In my opinion, it goes absolutely against God and his character and what he has clearly uh, presented in the Bible and through a relationship with Christ for Christians. Uh, there is no excuse for it. There is no defense for it. Uh, William Wilberforce, a Christian in Parliament, worked for 30 years in Parliament to get slavery abolished in England, and he finally was able to do so. But he did it because he understood, and he says this clearly, that it goes against God as a, as a person, God's character, and it goes against clearly what God's Word says. So uh, he ironically was able to accomplish that in England before it happened in America, in the United States, and did so without a civil war. Anyway, uh, of the 11 million African slaves that were traded and brought to the New World, uh, five percent of those came to what we know as the United States prior to the existence of this nation to the colonies okay like Virginia the Carolinas Georgia to those colonies and those slaves were brought to the southern colonies exclusively because the idea was to get slave labor to work in the fields for uh, for economic reasons um, and, of course, this eventually led to a great conflict between the northern United States and the southern United States over that issue of slavery. And we ended up with Lincoln's uh, founding of the Republican Party in 1860, which he, he identified as the anti-slavery party. He founded it to oppose slavery. And then uh, in the early 1860s, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation that eventually led to the, the uh, uh, elimination of slavery entirely, but not without the great conflict and the loss of, excuse me, loss of much life in the, in the war between the states. Um, but about 5% of those 11 plus million slaves were brought to what we know as the United States of America. That 5% uh, spins out numerically to about one half million, okay, uh, 500,000 or so. Slaves. Now that's a lot of slaves, and that's way too many guys. That, that's there's no excuse for it. <clears throat> but uh, it might be interesting for you to understand as well that in the Civil War, approximately the same number of soldiers lost their lives, bringing an end to slavery, as the total number of slaves that were brought to this country. And I think that's an interesting parallel figure. Uh, that tells me that they must have been pretty serious about ending it if they were willing to sacrifice so much. But alongside that, we have approximately 11 million slaves. If we say there were 11 million 500,000 slaves and 500,000 of those came here, you have 11 million slaves that were sent to other places. And rarely do you hear anybody talk about that. But that's really significant. Where did they go? Well, the vast majority went to the Caribbean, and they went to South America. Why? Because in the Caribbean, there was a, a strong sugar trade industry, and they wanted people to work again They wanted people to work again in the fields and the sugar trade industry, and they wanted cheap labor or labor that they didn't have to pay for, you know, to pay salaries and labor that could be maintained because it was labor that was owned, not hired. Uh, a significant number of the slaves went to South America to work in the mines, the gold, silver, uh, lead mines of South America, as well as other kinds of labor as well. But uh, the lion's share of all of the African slaves did not come to the United States. They went other places. And a curiosity to me, to me is... Uh, why is that so rarely discussed and talked about? Because that's significant. Those slaves mattered too. 
Um, when you ask who was providing the slaves for the Caribbean and for Latin America, certainly part of those slaves, a portion of them were provided by uh, the British Empire, by England. But the majority of those slaves were provided by Spain and Portugal, not England. And, of course, this ties into who controlled the Caribbean, who controlled those uh, regions of Latin America. And they were largely under the control of Spain and Portugal. So, of course, they would supply the slaves to work in Spanish and Portuguese uh, lands in the New World. And it's just interesting to me that so rarely do we talk about the actual facts of who went where, who provided the slaves to those regions, and how the numbers fall out. So anyway, that's not to make a, uh, you know, I'm not attempting to make any kind of a, a political or moral statement about all of this, because slavery is slavery and it's bad no matter what. But I just wanted to clarify for you some of the figures and some of how that occurred. And you can think about that yourself. I invite you to do research. There's some great material out there that really uh, provides good data and information you know, to, to help us understand and help you understand what really went on. That I, I always feel like the more we know about the facts, the more equipped we are to talk intelligently about not only what happened, but how we should feel about it and how we should prevent something bad from happening in the future. So I hope that helps you. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. When we come back together next week on Tuesday, we'll make the transition from Judaism into Christianity uh, and uh, uh, we'll tie those together because they have to be because, after all, Jesus was Jewish and the early church was almost exclusively Jewish in the first few years you know, first 10, 15 years, but then it explodes and expands into really all kinds of people from all kinds of different places, which, as I said, this was the call that God gave to the Jews originally in the Old Testament. And now we see in Christianity coming out of Judaism a, a fulfillment of that calling. Now, I will tell you that the church also failed at numerous times in numerous places to respond to people exactly the way I think Jesus taught his followers to respond. And you'll remember, for example, when I talked about the persecution of Jews by the uh, Roman Catholic Church during the uh, Middle Ages, the early and high Renaissance uh, is a good example of, of that failure. So anyway, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. As I like to always say, stay safe, be kind, and come back and see me.